Hello and welcome to the Providence College Podcast. I'm Joe Carr. Our guest today is Lisa Skink, a 1983 PC graduate who has had a long and distinguished career in the law. An ROTC graduate who majored in political science, Lisa served as an Army lawyer and judge for 25 years, retiring as a colonel. A legal scholar and a teacher who has, believe it or not, four law degrees, Lisa is currently an Associate Dean for Academic Affairs at George Washington University Law School. PC recognized her accomplishments by awarding her with an honorary Doctor of Laws degree in 2018. Well, thanks for joining us, Lisa. Oh, thanks for having me. And just so people know, Lisa and I were classmates and have been good friends since we showed up here in 1979 as first-year students. Hate to break it to you, that's (laughs) 40 years ago this month. So how about that? That's crazy. So you're here this uh, weekend to uh, speak at a uh, gathering of the college's liberal arts honors program. Tell us about that, how that came about, and what you plan to share with with those folks on Saturday. Yeah, so um, I received an email from Suzanne Fournier um, talking about the symposium and asking me if I would consider speaking at the symposium. This is a year ago. So it was right around after, it was last September, so it was after I'd received uh, the honorary degree. So I assumed that my information had been passed from one office to the other. And uh, I was very excited about it. And I thought, well, this is interesting. And then she gave me what the topic was, the conscience of public life. So I kind of went around the office and I was like, anybody know what the heck that would mean? I don't know what that means. And um, I did some research on it and and came up with, and she said, well, you know, we schedule a phone call, and she said, well, you know, think about your career and in public life. And I said, no, I'll I'll take a look at that. And I was thinking, you know, I don't know if that's relevant to my life and my uh, public life. So I did some research and um, found out that, well, the conscience of public life at least from my experiences, was dealing with the armed forces and my role as a judge advocate as a, uh, in the Army Judge Advocate General's Court, which I was in for 25 years. Well, actually, I had been in the ROTC program mm-hmm. and thought I was going to just go in the reserves, but then was told I was going active duty. And then I went in the Army, and so I was a signal officer. So I was in the regular Army. And so I kind of looked at the judge advocates and thought, geez, they're really fun. I want We have all these judge advocates advising us. I want to be one of them because they really seem fun, and I always wanted to be a lawyer. And so then um, the Army paid for me to go to law school. So in the scope of this uh, conscious of public life and the research I did, I came up with the, this thought that the judge advocates are considered the guardians of ethics for the profession of arms. That This phrase is used quite a bit in the research. And, uh, you know, I really never really looked at being a judge advocate as a, a guardian of ethics. Um, I looked at them when I was a signal officer as the ethics advisors. And so um, I did some research on that. And so now I'm going uh, to do a talk on Saturday, at Saturday's symposium about um, the judge advocates as the legal guardians of ethics for the profession of arms. You know, choosing the harder right over the easier wrong, um, that's that's pretty much what, we're at, what I'm going to cover. That's a subject that's baked into a lot of ethical considerations and concerns, isn't it? So that, yes. that kind of tracks back to what PC is kind of about in some ways with what it has always taught its students with respect to things like um making ethical or ethics-based decisions it all kind of fits together, doesn't oh, it? Yeah. It goes back to de- uh, development of Western civilization. No question. Everything always does. I talk about that for credit class. I mean, a lot. That two, two years of unbelievable literature, philosophy, history. I, I talk about it starting with the Mesopotamia, and I, I still remember it all. And Norton's Anthology, that big paper book with those thin pages, uh, I really, really enjoyed that class, even though it was hard. And I remember everybody, I don't know if you remember this, everybody yelling outside out the dorm rooms before the exam. They would open the windows. It would be like midnight. And people would start screaming and screaming. And the stress was unbearable just because of the implications on your GPA. Uh, but I really enjoyed that. And of course, we had philosophy in there. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think you're right. I think between that heavy coursework that just gives you a foundation for the first two 
years of the college, plus the fact that I think the classes in religion that we were required to take really embedded this whole integrity thing. Um, and I said this, uh, I've said this a lot at the law school when, uh, you know, people would want to put a statement out and I'd say, I don't think that's actually factual. I mean, to me, in the end, all you have is your integrity and everybody you know, looks at me like, geez, what is she talking about? But it's true. That is in the end, all you have is your integrity. And, uh, I think Providence college really put that thought forever. And, and, and then, you know, forces, they rely on you f to be the ethical, the moral compass. And so I think you're expected as an officer to have higher standard. You're ex expected each service has values. Um, you're expected as a judge advocate, you're expected to have, follow the professional rules, responsibility of your service, of your state. You have to be bar certified. Um, and the commanders know that and the other line officers know that. So I learned that when I was a signal officer, we turned to the JAGs. I would get the ja get the judge in here, and then they'd call the judge advocate in there to help you kind of get your moral compass on track or any kind of really difficult decisions. Uh, but I think it goes back to PC. You know, between the ROTC program, we have classes that teach you this kind of stuff, and you do studies on errors in the past. Uh, plus the religion classes and the, the development of Western civilization, I think. That program, which we call CIV, and is mm -hmm. now often called DWC, started in 1971. But and so we were kind of early on in uh, in its development. But the great thing is it persists to today. And fundamentally, it's very much the same. It's four days a week instead of five. There are some, some things that are, are somewhat different, too. But it's a, a unique characteristic of the Providence College academic experience. And it, it's had great impact on all of us. By the way, I don't remember that business of people yelling out to each other when studying. What I do remember is everyone wanted to study with you. Oh, I <laughs> so, love that. Yeah, that was good for our <laughs> grades. So uh, it was uh, thank you yeah, in retrospect for, for that, that help and that important thing. Um, you touched on your ROTC experience. Let's kind of go back to uh, what brought you here from Somerset, Massachusetts to PC and how ROTC was, was part of that and the, the interesting story about your transition to the professional military life. Yeah, so um, I originally, I, I'm from 20 miles away, uh, Somerset, Mass, and I really didn't apply to a lot of colleges. My family didn't have a lot of money, five girls. Uh, we just didn't have a lot of money to pay for college. My sister commuted to Rhode Island College, and so the thought was, well, maybe I can commute. I can she can just drop me off, and I can if I can get into Providence, I can go there. Um, of course, we had a good basketball team, and it was on Still TV do. quite a bit. And mm -hmm. so I, I remember thinking, well, I, I really like to go to Providence. It, it, it had uh, all the things I was interested in, and when I came to the campus, I really thought. You know, really felt like this is the place for me. And this happened to my son, too, when he went to the campus of the school he wanted to go to. You just have that feeling. And I had that feeling. And I thought, well, I can I can just commute. Um, and so what I did is I applied and I ended up getting an academic scholarship for the first year and work study. Uh, and so I made it through. And I think I had like a thousand dollar loan or something. But that was about it. And then I got this ROTC scholarship. My dad was um at the time, he was a recruiter, and of course, he was a military recruiter in Army National Guard, and he knew about all these scholarships. So he had me apply for this scholarship. My two sisters um, were um, applied to college, were fully funded to Westfield State by joining the National Guard. So my one sister commuted, then there was me, I had the the, the academic scholarship and then got the ROTC scholarship, the three year ROTC scholarship. And then my two other sisters were uh, basically enlisted in the, in the guard <laughs> and uh, got their tuition, um, full tuition paid. So I really wasn't an army person. I wouldn't say I woke up thinking, Oh, I want to go in the army. I think I was more, I always wanted to be an attorney. I remember that I was going to be an attorney and I, uh, I had no other, I, I only applied to one other college besides Providence College. And I got material, everyone gets materials in the mail. I remember getting lots of materials in the mail, but just um, 
the fees for applications were just too much. And so I thought, well, I'll apply. But it was Providence and uh, William and Mary. And of course, I couldn't afford to go there. Um, and when I got an academic scholarship to Providence, it was just pretty much easy. But looking back on it now, I can't even believe I only applied to two colleges. That was like, really stupid. And I remember specifically no one helping me with the application. And things have really changed with that process. You sure have. Uh, and uh, I don't. I don't remember taking any prep course for the for the SATs. I don't remember any of that. I don't remember taking SATs. I, I have no knowledge or recollection of that. Well, let's hope you did. Yeah, I <laughs> definitely did. Um, I remember taking the LSATs, but I don't remember taking the SATs. And then ROTC here. Oh, well, by the way, let's go back to one other thing quickly. So uh, you ended up living on campus. There's some real brain power in that room in McVinney Hall because your roommate, Colleen Cronin Duffy, is now a member of the College Board of Trustees and, yeah. and a great friend of yours to, yeah. to this day. She's wonderful. And an attorney. Mm -hmm. She went to law school. She's, you know, she, she's living the dream now. Right. Um, yeah. It, it is interesting because I wanted to go to law school in undergrad, and Colleen didn't really talk about going to law school in undergrad, but we both ended up in the same location. And uh, she's a wonderful person. She really is a wonderful person. It's so nice to have her in my life. She sure is. I think uh, we'll all agree with that for sure. And so the ROTC experience here, that's something that, as we talked about before, you really grew into and yes. it really came to be a big part of, of what the overall PC experience was yeah. about for you. It's so funny. You should ask Colleen about like me and, and ROTC because I was, a cheer, I was a hockey cheerleader simultaneously. So I didn't... I, I just wanted my, my check basically the first year, the sophomore year. I'm like, oh, I'm just going to go get my check every once a month and take the class. So it was a class associated. And I remember telling Colin, well, I got to go get my check. I got to go get my ROTC check. Uh, and it was only $100 a month, but I lived on $100 a month. And I remember the professor of military science, science the PMS, they said, oh, you can't get your check only until you meet with the PMS. And I was like, why do I have to meet with him? I just want my check. And then they called me in and he said, well, you know, this check associated with this check is this thing called military service. And I was like, yeah, I'm just, okay. You know, I'm a sophomore. I got time to think about that. Uh, so we want to test whether or not you can be, you, you'll be a good fit and you'll be happy in the military service. So we have this thing called ROTC weekends and we do things like go to the range and we go to um, land navigation and we do trips to areas. And I said, uh, it was so, it's so funny looking back on this. I said, oh yeah, I really don't have time for those weekends. You know, so <laughs> <laughs> the hockey games are generally on the weekends. And so <laughs> I really don't want to go on those. But thanks for inviting me. <laughs> I'll take it under advisement. Bye. Get my check and leave. And his face, <laughs> I think it was a colonel. Uh, which is an 06 high, high rank. And I remember, thanks. See you later. You know, no, I can imagine his thought, like, what is this woman? What is going on with her? Um, and so gradually the other students, I guess he must have spoken to the other students who were in the ROTC program. And they were from Bryant, students from Bryant. There were three students from Bryant, I remember, and uh, other people in our battalion, uh, our ROTC or ROTC unit, and he had them talk to me. He said, you got to talk to her because she's not getting it. She does not understand what's involved. Because I did run, but I wasn't like a runner. I became a runner later in the Army. I like running, but, but frankly, I would only run if I had like some kind of hangover, and I really feel, <laughs> I thought I would feel better if I'd run over to our Rhode Island College. Let me just take a jog and come back. Um, and then they didn't have form formations here. They didn't have ROTC um, physical fitness. I think they do in most units now, at least at GW, the university. You see the students forming up, and they do have them do physical fitness. So they kind of get a feel for the formation, well, military formation. We see that here. So it certainly yeah. happens with ROTC yeah. today yeah. at PC. Yeah. Back mm -hmm. then, think about it. This is like the 70s, right? 79, 80. And back then, people even didn't wear their uniforms across campus. You didn't want anybody to know you were in the ROTC. You, you carried your uniform to the ROTC office, which was near the commuter cafeteria. 
and you'd sneak in and change and then go to the class because you had to wear at some classes you had to wear a uniform and and you wouldn't wear it on the campus yeah so no one knew i was an rotc it was kind of like this big secret and then gradually i think i got better i think they made me like an officer i had to do um, lead stuff and then um kind of got attuned to it but you know at first i like missed uh trips and was supposed to be going and didn't show up and I, mean, I was not, I was not a good service member. <laughs> well, the colonel apparently saw something in you if he, <laughs> he uh, identified the need for the other students to to try to get you on track and so forth. <laughs> you you said a moment ago that uh, you really weren't getting it, but eventually you sure did because you uh, embarked on a twenty five year career, distinguished career in the army, yeah. which uh, ended up with you retiring as a a colonel. So from PC, some service in the regular army and then to Notre Dame law school, right? Right. So, um, it's interesting cause I came in, I always say I came in in the army, but I was always getting out. So I, I, I thought you know, there's two ways you, I could come in. I could go directly in to the signal corps and serve my time. I think I owed them five years or four years and then, or I could go to law school, take an education as a life, pay for law school myself. And at that time it was like a 16% pickup rate to go from uh, paying your own law school into the, the JAG Corps. What does that mean, pickup that, rate? I mean, they would only select 16% oh, okay. of the people who paid mm -hmm. for their own law degree to go in the JAG Corps. The rest of them had to go back to their basic branch. So I uh, essentially was facing, well, maybe I pay for myself, take an education as a lay, and then I'd end up getting all that debt and then end up being forced to go in the Signal Corps anyway for four years and not be practicing law in the military. So I kind of weighed those options, and I said I'm just going to serve my time. So I went in the signal. I went in the signal corps with a view towards getting out. I'm just going to do my time and get out. And I said, you know, I just want to go to law school. I'm just going to serve my time and get out. And so I did the training, and then I got assigned to uh, Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. And the funny thing about the military is they coded me. They have a code. They coded me as an electrical engineer. No. Oh. And I just tested out of math. I never took math at Providence <laughs> College. I, 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 and I kept telling the other wrote letters. I'm not an double E. I am not an electrical engineer. I, ta I've never taken math since high school. And they, they write, we're going to send you to the special school at Biloxi, Mississippi for six months. We're going to make you an electrical engineer. And I'm like, you physically have to operate on my brain because. <laughs> I plugged in my blow dryer and it blew up. That's my relationship with electronics. It doesn't work. And I kept writing and they didn't, they didn't listen. And so I was faced with a potentially going to the school to be an electrical engineer. Uh, meanwhile, before I did that, I applied for the funded legal education program in the army. I got selected. There were only 10 people selected a year. And now they picked more. I think they picked 25, but you know, I had to get interviewed in the, the, the the um, judge advocate, the staff judge advocate, the head of lawyer interviewed me and he said, this is an, uh, this is a West Point program, basically the fund of legal education program. So it's basically telling me I'm not getting picked. So I was like, oh, I guess I'm not getting picked for that. And then I ended up getting picked and um, going to uh, Notre Dame because there were a list of 10 schools you couldn't go to because of the, because of the homosexual policy. Um, there were certain schools you couldn't go to because they wouldn't allow uh, military recruiting on campus. And so there was this uh, litigation going on. So you couldn't go to Berkeley, you couldn't go to Harvard, you couldn't go to Yale. Um, and for some odd reason, I like the uh, Catholic school of like Notre Dame. I mean, I don't know why people ask me, why, why Notre Dame? I'm like, I have no idea. I think it was the Catholic thing. <laughs> and um, so they pay f your pay, your books, tuitions, your, your fees your your pay and go there to school for for three years and you owe them six and that's so funny because i was getting out when i came in so fast forward many years later 25 years later at my retirement everyone said you're gonna you're gonna cry at retirement i mean 25 years went by really fast and my response was yeah i'm not gonna cry because i've been getting out since i came in <laughs> and I didn't cry. And here we are. Yeah, so. exactly. Like for, you say 40 years, it, it's, you could tell me maybe four years, but you're saying 40 years. And I, I really can't wrap my head around that at all. I don't want to gloss over 
many years of this important career, but I think I will. Um, yeah. <laughs> so you served as a, as an army lawyer for a long time and obviously successfully, and then became a judge in the JAG Corps and beyond that part of the three per, three judge panel kind of at the top of the army system of jurisprudence and on top of that the lead judge there so right. this is really a pretty remarkable and steep climb uh what do you think it was about your attributes that that caused the army to take to see its way clear to putting you in in such important roles in this system so um i think in the JAG Corps, you don't get to specialize now. They have this litigation track. But if you looked at my career path, I tried a, a lot of cases. Basically, I had 100% conviction rate when I was a prosecutor and taught constitutional and military law at West Point. Um, but I have these other degrees that are environmental law, international and environmental law. But at the JAG school, when I went to get a law degree there, I focused in military justice and I got a degree in criminal military criminal law there. So if you were the judge advocate general looking down at who's there, they probably wouldn't tag me as an environmental law attorney, even though I worked environmental law. I worked on the Hill uh, with the generals. I sat behind them while they testified. Um, they would probably say I was a criminal law attorney uh, because pretty much that's what I, I focused in. I wrote articles on criminal law areas. I proposed a, uh, a criminal statute that they adopted as part of my thesis. So I think from their perspective, and then I worked in criminal law division, like the epitome of the Department of the Army criminal law. Um, so from their perspective, I was probably going to get out if they didn't put me on that court, because that was really the only job I would stay in for when I was a lieutenant colonel. They said, oh, what job can we give you to have you stay in? And I was at a retirement briefing in, in my car driving, and they called me. Well, they, the assignments people asked me, there were colonels, and I said, oh, you know, I want to go to the Army Court. And they said, Lisa, everybody wants to go to the Army Court. <laughs> and at that time, frankly, there were a bunch of old white guys on the Army Court. And I said, yeah, and they don't know anything about criminal law, so have fun with that, because you're making bad law with those guys that have been in the service. He said, the, the, um, the judges on that court have been in the Army for 28 years. And my response was, yeah. And they don't know anything about criminal law. So have fun with that, sir. <laughs> I'm hit, sitting here at the retirement brief getting ready to, to we call it drop paper. And um, and I said, that's just the job. Yeah. And I only had 18 or not even 19 years. I probably had 18 and a half, 19 years. And uh, I was in environmental law, and I'd been working on the Hill, sitting behind these generals, testifying. And frankly, I haven't, uh, you know, the Hill is bad now. I look at the Congress now and what goes on, those hearings that they publicize. But having lived through it, and it wasn't as bad as it is now. It was just to me, I, I just said, I can't do this. I can't have these sit behind these generals who are working so hard for the services and have them being called to the table by people who don't know anything about the issues and who are given questions from their staffers who don't care what the responses are. They only care what the questions are. I, I couldn't do that. I did it for like 20 hearings on the Hill. And I said, so I, that's why I was going to get out. And the the generals of the JAG, or the two generals, said, they called me on my cell phone again and said, okay, if we send you to the court, we stay in. And I said, you know, I'm really ready to get out right now, so I need 24 hours. And I went home and asked my husband, hey, so do you think I, what do you think I should do? He said, well, that's the job you always wanted. That's the job. It's like armchair quarterbacking, and it goes out to the field making law and uh, interpreting the law. And so I said, okay. So I said I would do it. Of the 10 years, three years, and um, I, I was facing a promotion board after two. And they had said, you'll stay in at least two, maybe three. And frankly, that's not a good job for promotion. A good job for promotion is the staff judge advocate in Iraq, uh, Fort Hood, Fort Bragg. Uh, paper cuts in D.C. Uh, sitting on the appellate bench is not a good promotion position, not a good place to be for promotion. And so um, I remember they came to me and they said, so you're going to stay in the Army. And it was before the promotion board. 
And I said, uh, I don't know, sir, why don't you tell me? Because <laughs> uh, he said, well, maybe you should take your chances at that board. Because I had gotten really good evaluations. And so I ended up getting picked up for promotion. The tenure on that court is three years. They just created a tenure on that appellate court um, for the Army. And uh, I ended up staying on that court almost six years on the mm -hmm. court. Uh, uh, Secretary Gates appointed me to the Court of Military Commission Review as an additional duty. Um, there were two service judges from each service to, well, I think there were, yeah, there were two Army, two Navy Marine. There might have been more Navy Marine because it's a joint, and then two Air Force, and then two civilians. And I was appointed on that court as an additional duty. Um, and so they never moved me off there. I, I stayed on there uh, on the court. But, you know, at some point, and I probably could have stayed longer because I got out at 25 years, but what happens is when you're on that seeing, I saw 2,000 criminal cases, and I remember my senior judge said, oh, at some point, you're just going to know it's time to retire. So I was on the, the commission, the Court of Military Commission's Review, which is the appellate court for the detainee cases, but I never really sat on any of those court, courts. Um I attended, you know, oral arguments, but I never actually wrote any opinions on that. Um, but I think that's primarily the reason they didn't rotate. One of the reasons, because those judges need to stay on there. Those cases take a long time to come up. Um, but my senior judge said, you're going to know when it's time to go. And it, it, you see, I saw these just horrific, two horrific crimes. And I just knew I can't. I can't look at this anymore. When you reflect generally on that experience with with the Army Appellate Court, are there some things that, that give you a particular sense of pride? You talk about making law. Were there changes or um, new ways of looking at things that you were able to affect in, in that role? Yes, yeah, so it's really interesting. When I was a, a major, I proposed an article, in the, uh, a punitive article, in the Uniform Code of Military Justice, which I didn't think was going to go forward. It was just an academic article. And um, it was an academic article. I didn't have a son. I didn't have a child. And it was child neglect. And so the, the appellate bench, which I eventually sat on, had written an opinion and said, this person can't be prosecuted for this uh, because there's no notice that child neglect is a crime. They have to be on notice under this article. It wasn't a, it wasn't a numbered article saying, hey, child neglect is a crime. It was just this other article. It's a general article. And so I wrote a article on it saying let's create an article uh, a crime and put it in the UCMJ I mean either and I surveyed all the state UCMJ statutes UCMJ is a uh, uniform code of military justice let's make it a crime so everyone's on notice so that people can be prosecuted um, for these cases where they leave the child alone and, um, the case that I think the case that was they said they weren't on notice I think the, the, the child was died of septicemia. I mean, it was a clear cut child neglect case. Um, so I surveyed all the state statutes, categorized them, did this big fancy article, I surveyed the field and it got published. And so it was like a major, I had no kids, you know, it's like 95. Then I'm at West Point years later and now I have a son. And I, my recommendation was like, children shouldn't be left alone till they're 12. I mean, it was just over the top, you know, it was like punitive regulations. If you leave your kid home when they're 12, you know, all these crimes. And um, I remember the, the criminal law division, which I eventually worked at, calling and saying the general, the judge of a general wants to propose your article in the Uniform Code of Military Justice. And I was like, are you kidding me? That's not a good idea. So it kind of took some time. Then I was assigned there in 99. Now my son's was by that time two and I, and they said, oh, they're going forward. They're giving that to the other judge advocate generals. It's going to be one of the proposals. And I said, I really don't agree with my own article now. I have a <laughs> child, and I think he should be able to stay home alone because he he's going to be, he's fine. He can run the microwave. He has a cell phone. And he's really, really annoying. And I don't want to be home with him alone until he's 12. Can we change the proposal? 
I was not kidding. I was in fear. You're going to put the, make this a crime through the whole army? I've made all myself the a criminal. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> and so they ended up, they did propose it. There is a crime in there. It's just not as restrictive as the one that was originally proposed in my article. <laughs> so that made an impression. But when you get on the bench, so, so I remember seeing that when I was a major. And now, fast forward, I'm on the bench and the, the court saying, you got to be on notice. You know, there's no void in the law. So... At the time I was on the court, there was a big thing about judges making law. Like I think John McCain's, uh, one of his uh, platform items was uh, no uh, law-making judges or something. I have a pin in my office that said it was a McCain pin. And uh, so I used to I used to say, hey, you know, we interpret the law. That's what we are supposed to do, or interpret the law. But sometimes you're making the law when you're interpreting the law. Um, there was one case, I, there's no law on it. My commissioner, my clerk said, ma'am, I wrote the opinion. And he said, but ma'am, there's no case law on that. And I said to him, I know. That's why I'm writing this opinion. <laughs> so people can know that you can be AWOL when you're in the barracks. <laughs> Just because you're in the barracks doesn't mean you're not guilty of AWOL. <laughs> and he said, but ma'am, the Navy's opinion says that you know you can't i said if you're on a ship and they can't find you you're a bad leader <laughs> I said, it's entirely different when the unit's in the field and you're hiding in the barracks <laughs> and i wrote the opinion and i got affirmed and it's out there and it's law and i it's in the book that i wrote our uh, military justice book that i used for class so it's kind of funny because the footnote says you know, uh, we understand our our brother in a Navy ju- uh, court has a different opinion, but pretty much if you can't find the guy on the ship, <laughs> you're a bad leader. <laughs> your, your reference class in the book that you use in teaching in a couple of minutes ago, you talked about teaching at West Point, but then after retiring from the Army, there's a, a full-fledged transition to academic life at George Washington right. University. That's a major change. Sure. What were yeah. some of the challenges and what are some of the rewards? Yeah, it's really it's really interesting because that's probably two really big extremes to go from like the Department of Defense where at meetings, uh, I'll never forget sitting at the table in a meeting with the deputy deputy undersecretary of defense, and then people going around the room and you know I, I had to say things like, well, the army's not going to do that, the army's not going to do that, and you know very direct, and I remember get, people going to the room and the deputy undersecretary of defense saying. To one of the services, okay, your concerns are noted and disregarded, moving on. That's pretty direct. <laughs> but then getting to academia, and it's the faculty meeting, and I worked for a senior associate dean, and he was a reserve judge advocate. He, he hadn't deployed, and he was just very academic, clerk for two Supreme Court justices. And we went to the faculty meeting, and it was all this fluff, people standing up and saying fluff. And then we leave the meeting, and he says to me, Gee, that was a very contentious meeting, don't you think? I was like, are you kidding me? Nobody said anything relevant. <laughs> nobody called anybody names. And nobody said, your concerns are noted, but disregarded, moving on. I said, I thought that was a pretty friendly meeting, frankly, compared to the Department of Defense meetings I've been to in my career. He said, oh, I thought it was very contentious. I said, well, they're not very direct. I'll give them that. It's a matter of perspective, right? Right, exactly. So- very contentious. Funny. So then, so I think that's... I've lived through that. It'll be 10 years in November that I've been in academia. Um, the upside, though, are, are the students. And the students are just the reason you come to work every day. When I was on active duty and you have down days and there's so much bureaucracy and they make you go to lunch with people you don't want to have lunch with because you're a female colonel, um, I'd say to my friend, that's it. I'm quitting. I can't take this bureaucracy anymore. This is a bunch of hoo-ha. And you have to form up for formation at six and the run doesn't leave until seven. I mean, come on, you know, I'm going to run to the formation in, in DC particularly. And, um, she would, she and others would send me slideshows from people who were deployed with just pictures of them, you know, with the American flag and on their Blackhawks and, you know, just messages to people, the people in the field who are getting fired at are making slideshows for the people in D.C. who are threatening to quit. It's just ridiculous. But I'd look at that. And so you say, that's where I come to work every day. And now at the law school, it's like 
man, so much bureaucracy. I got three jobs. I got so much work. Everyone now knows you do all the work. So then they give you more work. And then you get the handwritten letter from somebody in the Air Force who's now married and their child is born and they want to thank you, you know, it's like, or the email from an international LLM student who came from some foreign country and didn't think that they would be able to fit in in the, this giant law school and they're th uh, they're thanking you because you were the reason that they you know, enjoyed every one of their classes and now they're working and it's just really just wonderful to get those emails and cards and I keep them and I think well wow, geez and with, with the um, students a lot of my students go in the judge advocate generals course so we're a feeder school almost to all the services and those students now are the field screening officers coming back they're like on their third tour I have one student in the Air Force who's now back for his master's in law. He's like had three deployments. It's just like, <laughs> yikes. How is that working? But anyway, so it's, it's nice to see him come back. Well, your ability to, the ability to navigate this transition, I think, is reflective of what you've done throughout your career and really in your life. And that is to find ways to get things done and get them done really well. And I suppose that relates, taking it back to the beginning, to some of what your PC experience was and, and some of the things that we were taught and some of the perspectives and insights we gained you know, you know, way back when. Yeah, you know, it, it's also the PC, just the general PC population. You know, the, the people who go to PC, um, and it's the same at Notre Dame. It's really, I think the Pope said this about Notre Dame, you know, you got your eyes closed and you still know you're at Notre Dame, right? But it's just a feeling, like Prov uh, Providence I don't remember going off campus very much. And look at the size of the campus. Do you remember going off campus no, a lot? Except to your apartment. Right. That's it. So I mean, I remember 105 the, acres. Right. And that's the, it. Right. The big blizzards and where are we going? Where, Slavin Center. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the Slavin Center went to your apartment. We had the um, last resort. Mm -hmm. And Colleen was a, a tar bender there. And I just remember, I have no... Like I look at it now and think, geez, this is a small campus, you know, and I have no, I have no recollection of ever being worried that we couldn't, didn't go off campus or go anywhere or you're snowed in or like, we didn't even go. I don't remember going to Brown ever. Right. And, and John F. Kennedy Jr. was going to Brown <laughs> and my, my friend from high school went to Brown and I never went there. I'm like, no, I'm too busy. Providence, we had movies outside. We, it just was so, every weekend there was something to do. There was just no downtime. And so the people are just so kind. And I think and it made, it just made it so easy. Uh, just so makes it easy to communicate with people too, I think. And boy, as political science majors, we had access to such a great faculty. Oh I mean, the the was professors like, who taught us yeah. were just wonderful. Yeah. I was taking Latin American studies or Latin American. Dr. Uh, Bob Trudeau. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He was going to be on Good Morning America that mm -hmm. morning. So his class got canceled. We had like, he's on TV. Are you kidding me? Oh yeah. He was great. And Dr. Bill Hudson and Dr. Mary Bellhouse oh, are still wow. on the faculty That's here. So and there we had Professor Mark Hyde and Jeez. Professor... Jim Carlson. You know what's funny, Jim? Do you remember how difficult it was to write papers? We had to type our papers. We had to type right, our papers. actual typewriters. Yeah, with typewriters. I mean, my roommate, Dolores Burke, um, she was a pretty good typist. And I remember I was I was one of these people that procrastinated on my paper. And I remember writing a paper for one of these poli sci classes. And it was the, uh, the benefits of the incumbent in the presidential, the benefits of... Um, with, advantages with the, maybe the benefits mm -hmm. uh, with the media you mm -hmm. know the the, mm -hmm. the media for the incumbent uh, presidential incumbent so basically had to go back and look at all the magazine articles and look at uh, how many times they're mentioned in articles and how much more press they got and i remember i made note cards you know to use the quotes and the and and i remember just dictating to dolores typing and throwing the card, you know, it's like, here's the quote, throw, quote, blah, 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 throw the card, you know? Yeah. It was a great thing when electric typewriters came along, remember? So oh, yeah. it made it much easier. <laughs> so. Remember we had the elements with the ball on it. That was like the original oh, right. with the ball, pretty good. like a 12 pitch or whatever. So I'm guessing you were writing that paper for either Dr. Carlson or Dr. Hudson. 
Yeah. That's my guess. So yeah, uh, exactly. They, they were great. Dr. Friedman, the, Dr. Allsfeld, the, the list, Dr. Romans. I think we may have named them all by now. So yeah. Dr. Marsh, they were, yeah. Yeah, that's probably about it. So yeah. they were wonderful. We were lucky to have, not to mention all the professors for Western Civ and the, and the other core courses that we took. Uh, we were, we were lucky to be here at that time. And the students today are equally lucky. Yeah, we were. We had such fabulous faculty members. Great yeah. support all, all the way around Dominicans and, and everybody else too. So, uh, a great time to be students here. So uh, one more one more thing, 2018. What was it like to get the word that your alma mater was going to give you an honorary degree? And then what did it feel like that weekend in May? Unbelievable. First of all, the letter came FedEx around the holidays. And I gave, I, my husband always gets FedExes. I never get FedExes. So I gave him the FedEx and he opened it and he read the letter from the president. And I thought he was joking around. I was like, yeah, that's really funny. No, serious. That's really funny. He's like, I'm not kidding. I'm like, yeah, I don't think so. And he showed me the letter and it said, don't say anything to anybody because we have to present this to the board and get the board. And I, I said, well, you can't tell anybody. I proceeded to think they were going to retract it. So I didn't tell anybody. I just kept it quiet because I was so scared that it was like, they're not going to approve it. It's not going to get approved. And it was shocking. It was just unbelievable my mother cried they were in the front my sister and mother and it just like overwhelms because don't forget my family's local so and then the magazine when the magazine came out they were just over the moon and you know after the magazine so we had the the degree they came got the degree and then my mother just keeps saying what a class act providence college is because they give you the degree right the folded degree open and I'm thinking I got to get this framed. And the president says, oh, Lisa, don't frame that. We're going to send you a, a framed one. Oh, so I got, I got one. And then I got the, the framed one, the citation. It's on my, in my office. And then a, one of the vice presidents sent me this lovely picture framed, with this beautiful note, the picture of the magazine. So, yeah, they put it on the portal page for the uh, GW Law School. It was really just unbelievable. And of course, it's on my resume. <laughs> As well, it should be richly deserved honors. The best so degree you can get, the one you don't have to go to class for. <laughs> well, it was it was great, and all of us who who know you and think so highly of you we couldn't have not have been more thrilled that week, and and for that to to finally happen after uh, a long distinguished career it was certainly coming, and, and glad that it happened uh, on the occasion of our thirty fifth reunion. So oh, that's why that all ended up there in part. So that was great. Well, this has been a lot of fun, Lisa. Thank you for joining us today and for doing this and for what you're going to do this weekend with your talk to the Liberal Arts Honors uh, Program Colloquium. So great to see you again. Great to have you here on the podcast. Thank you so much. Our guest is Lisa Tebow Skank, class of 1983 and 18 honorable degree. So uh, uh, great to have her with us to talk about her interesting career today and her, her life as a of Providence College Friar. You can subscribe to the Providence College podcast at all the usual places and they're available on the college's YouTube channel. Feedback is welcome at podcast at providence.edu. Thanks to our producer, Chris Judge. I'm Joe Carr. Until next time.